Alex Wallace. No, Alex Wallace. Yeah. No, that's, that's on the abstract. It's not. It's <laughs> 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 oh, okay. I'm very sorry. But anyway, it works about how kidneys can be transplanted if you use glucose. <laughs> so, thank you. My apologies. This is Wallace. Um, hi there, so my name's Alex, and um, I'm, from, uh, I'm, I'm from Birmingham as well. And again, I was fortunate enough to get a Kidney Research UK Insulated Grant to um, support my work. So, the work that I was doing, um, along with the rest of my uh, renal research team, which is going to sound like quite a complicated title, but I'll try and break it down and make it as simple as we can. So it was basically trying to find out a new methodology of examining metabolism in an ex vivo whole organ setting. And we did this using um, 2D NMR techniques, using carbon-13 tracer studies, while under hypothermic machine perfusion. So why, why did we decide to do this? So I'm sure I don't need to tell what you guys has been kind of hammered home a lot. There's obviously a huge need to improve the amount of numbers and the availability of organs. We've got a large waiting list of around 6,000 people in the UK, which is a huge proportion, up to 90% of the total organ uh, waiting list. So the shortage of organs is a real issue for um, kidney transplant and avail avail availability. This is kind of reinforced by the fact that living donor renal transplant is shown to be the gold standard for end stage renal failure. So we have this great treatment we can have, we can give people, but we don't have enough organs to meet the demand at the moment. Broadly, we can split, in, split the ways of increasing the numbers of organs into either increasing donation numbers through kind of um, legislation and governmental means and education, or we can try and improve the availability, improve the quality of the available organs that we have. So when it comes to improving the quality of available organs, there's certain stages that we can intervene at. So there's people that have looked into intervening at the donation stage, that's trying to give donors things, um, and try and improve kind of pre-donation things. It's quite difficult to do though with kind of ethical improvement. Um, there's the storage phase and there's also post-transplant phase. So we decided to see if we could improve the organs while they're in the storage phase. Currently there's two main types of storage for organs um, and this is for a DCD um, model, so these are the cadaveric kidneys. They're either in static cold storage, which was the, the original um, kind of way they were stored, or more recently has been HMP, so hypothermic machine perfusion, and this is using, there's a variety of different machines that offer this, but the one that we used in our experiments was the um, LifePort kidney machine, which is also used in clinical practice in the Queen Elizabeth in Birmingham. So what were the aims and hypotheses of this, of this study? So we wanted to see if it was possible to use NMR to determine the metabolism of these organs while they were undergoing HMP. And we used two different types of techniques. We used 1D NMR, which some of you may be more familiar with, which is, allows quantification of metabolites. But what we added in this time, which is more of a novel thing that has not been done in whole organ ex vivo setting before, is this 2D NMR. And this allows tracer studies which identify specific metabolic pathways which are going on, rather than just the availability or the presence of certain metabolites. So just a brief introduction into NMR. I don't know how many experts there are here. I definitely wasn't one when I started, and it's quite a complicated topic. Um, it, NMR performs one of the different quantification techniques along with mass spec. Um, this is using a lot of metabolomic studies. And it detects signals from nuclei which absorb and re-emit signals when electromagnetic field um, and energy is passed through them. So this bit on spin is quite important, and this is why we use the carbon-13. So normally, carbon-12 has zero spin and is therefore not visible to NMR. Carbon-13 is half spin, which is visible to NMR. And the important thing to take from this is carbon-12 isn't visible, 13 is visible. And also the natural abundance is 1.1%. So in our studies, we used 100% fully labelled carbon-13 glucose, which allowed us to track this visible carbon-13 nuclei through their metabolic pathway. So that's the kind of important thing to take from this. So this is just a quick example demonstrating what you can do with that information. So these show the different labelling patterns of carbon-13 with the nucleus. And you get these different um, readouts once it's been processed through, through the NMR machine and, and undergoing Fourier transformation. The important thing you can do is by the different splitting pattern of this signal, you can work out 
where the carbon-13 is in the nucleus, which allows you to work out at what point in the metabolic pathway it's occurred, and also even how many cycles of things like the TCA cycle has occurred when this metabolite's been produced. So for example, if there's one here, so this, the black ones are carbon-13, the clear ones are carbon-12. So if you have one, it's just a, signal, a single signal. And this can be down to natural abundance, as there is 1.1% 1 .1 natural abundance. However, here, when you've got two adjacent, you get this splitting pattern. While if you have three, you get another, you get another splitting pattern. And labeling here, again, a different, you get a double split, but with different chemical shift. So again, the kind of point of this slide is to show you that you can get really detailed information of which carbon specifically has been incorporated into the um, compound. So this is what it can allow you to do. So this is some of the metabolic pathways in, um, in cells. It can look quite complicated from here. But if you start with fully labelled glucose, using the carbon-13 tracer study allows you to see whether you're going down one pathway. So for example, sorry, if you're going on one pathway, so for more of an anaerobic glycolytic pathway, or you can see whether you're going into a more anaerobic, um, sorry, a more aerobic pathway and going through this, the TCA cycle. And as I said, the labelling patterns you get can even let you know how many times the TCA cycle has been able to go around. So how did we do this and what were our methods? So we used a porcine model and previous research by our group compared uh, the metabolic profile between porcine and deceased donor human kidneys. So it was found to be comparable between the two. Um, and we used a paired model. So we had one, one pig um, which was slaughtered at an abattoir. Then we went to the abattoir. We take uh, one kidney from each, from each side so we use six kidneys in total, and then we put them onto this life port machine for 24 hours. So this is the life port HMP kidney perfusion machine, and this is um, this is provided by Organ Recovery Systems, who was um, partly funding our research as well. So this just shows you the kind of different different parts. You have the uh, bubble chamber here, the reservoir for ice to keep it cool, the connect the T connector for the for the kidney, the peristaltic pump here that pushes the perfusate around. And also you've got your controls here, so you can set your pressure and what you're doing with the organ. And this is currently used in clinical practice. So I had a few pictures of this, but I think my slides were getting a bit too big on the memories front, so I don't have the pictures, I'm just going to have to talk through this. So these are just the different stages. So first there was organ harvest at the abattoir, where the organs were taken, and we estimated, um, we timed, it was 13 minutes from death of the pig until the organs got to us. And this is obviously a DCD model as the pigs were being um, stunned and then killed. They were then um, at the abattoir, they were flushed with, um, with one, with one litre of, um, of Soltran, and then they were um, and they immediately put on ice and transported back to our centre in um, static cold storage conditions. They then underwent HMP for 24 hours, and samples were taken at a T0 point and every six hour interval. Then tissue samples were also taken at the end of the cortex and the medulla. The samples were then processed using our in-house um, protocol prior to NMR analysis, and then they were run both for 1D and 2D analysis on the NMR machines. So what did we find? So we found there was significant enrichment um, of central metabolites, notably lactate and alanine, which is what we would expect from this um, HMP model, as it's an anaerobic environment with no exogenous oxygen. Um, we found the total amount of increased lactate increased over time, so we can demonstrate there is metabolism occurring while under HMP conditions, and also the amount of enriched alanine also increased. And this is important with the enrichment as it's showing this is de novo metabolism which is happening after we put this glucose in rather than just metabolism which could have occurred before putting the glucose in. We also found surprisingly there was some glutamate present in the enrichment which may demonstrate there is actually some oxidative metabolism going on under these conditions, which is not which is was slightly surprising to us, but it's not impossible as the environment is not an anoxic environment and there is some level of oxygen dissolved in the perfusion fluid just through the air. So this is graphs demonstrating our results. So the change over time for lactate, change over time for alanine, and this is the absolute concentration and the absolute concentration. And we worked out the absolute concentration by combining our 1D quantification data with our 2D labelling data to work out what the concentration was of each of these metabolites. So what, do, so what are our conclusions? So we concluded that 
de novo metabolism does occur under HMP conditions. So there is active metabolism happening while these organs are being stored. And it also highlights some of the potential active pathways, which are these anaerobic um, glycolytic pathways. And also, though the majority is going down the glycolytic pathways, there is some going down the non-glycolytic pathway, demonstrated by the presence of labelled glutamate. And mainly, this study shows that it's possible to do this in a ex vivo setting. And these kind of um, investigate metabolism, metabolic pathways can be used in a wide range of settings. And we can therefore modify the conditions under machine perfusion and see how this affects the metabolic um, profile of the kidney. So what's a clinical application? How does it relate to patients? As I, as I mentioned, it demonstrates that we can do this to, to observe the metabolism and also the fact that metabolism occurs in this setting. And by better understanding this, we could hopefully develop new therapies or treatments to optimise this metabolism and provide the um, kidneys with what they need while they're under these storage conditions. And finally, we'll be able to see what the metabolic effects are of this modification and this future work we're doing looking at oxygenation and um, um, varying temperature as well. Thank you very much. So my apologies for misrepresenting you. It's okay, it's all right. You're more than made up for that. Um, questions? So let me start off with you. You carefully took samples from cortex and medulla. Yeah. How do they differ? Um, in their findings? Um, we found very similar in, in both, really. We, fo we focused on the cortex, but the, um, the, this was just the cortex data we presented. Yep. But the um, medulla findings were very similar as well, with their kind of metabolic profile. That's surprising. Um, would you think the whole thing is equally hypoxic once it's sitting around in the laboratory? I think the, um, you, you would expect the medulla to be more, more hypoxic, but I think perhaps the cold storage time getting from the ab abattoir to the um, to the kind of sample beginning and also the, the degree of um, cold s storage time might mean that it's all equally hypoxic. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yes, sorry. sorry, thanks. That was a great presentation. I just wanted to ask, sorry if I missed it. No, no. So you, you took six kidneys from three pigs. Yeah. Right, so when you were analysing your data, did you account for the fact that two kidneys were from the same pig and therefore they may be similar? Does that, does that make sense? Um, yeah, it does. It, we, we used a paired, um, a paired t-test when we did it. So we, we compared... Um, but the, the reason of doing... Even though two kidneys would be similar, we tried to run them both at the same time. So we had two life form machines. So we were doing kind of like constant um, models. But in terms of accounting for certain kidneys being different... It was, it was mainly just with our results and we found it was quite consistent between each one. So I'm not sure how we could account necessarily for them being uh, similar between the two. Did I There's a, a lot of interest uh, currently around normothermic uh, perfusion rather than hypothermic perfusion. Do you have any, is there any data or any suggestion of, of what you might expect to find if uh, these kidneys were perfused ex vivo using normothermic rather than hypothermic machine perfusion? So we haven't, we haven't done any of the normothermic and where there's quite a few people, people in Cambridge that are doing, doing that at the moment. Um, we'd expect that there'd be more of an um, aerobic uh, metabolism because they're um, less, it's less cooled. There might be more um, options that are available as well because the temperature of the water increased um, carrying capacity of the fluid. But to be honest, we don't we don't know what it is because we haven't we haven't done those experiments at this point. So I probably missed this, but what's the glucose concentration of the diffuser? Uh, it's ten uh, millimolar. Okay. So it's a suggestion from this that actually we should be hyperglycemically perfusing such kidneys. Do you think that would help? Or I don't suppose there's an answer to that. I mean, that's part of the problem with what we don't have kind of functional data really. It's just it's purely looking at the differences in in metabolism is kind of we, what we'd like to do or would obviously ideally like to have some level of functional outcome kind of mm. like a urine output or creatinine clearance yeah. after this to see how this affects the kidney yeah. Um, but yeah we don't we don't have that at this point not yet any other questions good well thank you very much
Alex. Cheers. Thank you.